Talk 10, carotid endoderectomy versus trans-carotid stenting for unstable plaques uh, by Dr. Leonard and colleagues from uh, UT, UT Houston and Indiana. Thank you very much to the Society for the opportunity to present. I promise to present and submit this abstract faster than I did last year's. Uh, the authors have nothing to disclose except for one author who serves as the national PI for the DW MRI study. So strokes, the fifth leading cause of mortality in the U.S., uh, estimated 20 percent of these strokes are related to some kind of carotid disease. We're all familiar with uh, TCAR, transcarotid artery revascularization. It combines minimally invasive benefits of transfemoral stenting with uh, neuroprotective flow reversal uh, during the delivery of the stent. So previously, the FDA had only approved TCAR for high-risk patients. This uh, Indication has now been expanded to standard risk patients. And we're familiar with Roadster 1 and 2 trials, which show non-inferior outcomes with TCAR compared to CEA. So here's just uh, a little summary of Roadster 1 and 2. Um, uh, Roadster 2 is obviously the, the better adjudicated study, 630 patients. Basically, uh, all patients were high risk in this study. The big takeaway here is stroke death in MI, 3.2 percent, all stroke rate, 1.9 percent. Again, uh, NPS, or neuroprotective system, was safe, non-inferior to the gold standard, which is carotid endarterectomy. So currently, risk stratification for stroke is based upon percentage of stenosis. And this percentage of stenosis is a good indicator of embolic risk during intervention, but it's not perfect. Uh, the literature is kind of... Uh, there's some ambiguity there in terms of the relationship between carotid plaque morphology and its influence on perioperative stroke, uh, and this is pretty poorly defined. Um, which we're all familiar with the carotids we've done where you see kind of a nice smooth lesion, um, and then the carotids we've done that have this co cottage cheese-like plaque, and we think, man, I can't believe we're putting stents and wires across this. Um, but, you know, different papers have come out trying to uh, stratify these patients by their plaque morphology. Uh, we all know that kind of lipid-rich necrotic core uh, plaques obviously have a, a higher kind of uh, embolic risk. And, and so we kind of looked at it, do these vulnerable, vulnerable lesions behave any differently interoperatively during CEA than TCAR? Um, so if we extrapolate that, I think, okay, maybe it's plaque morphology, maybe it's degree of stenosis, two previous papers, transcarotid revascularization timing and early postoperative uh, outcomes in symptomatic patients, so presumably some kind of unstable lesion. Um, you know, this looked at 875 T cars, 37 of percent of which were symptomatic, and um, they stratified patients on intervention by less than six days after the initial presentation or more. The, the, the real takeaway here is that um, they behave similarly um, in T car versus uh, CEA, these symptomatic lesions. But then if you take this other paper, outcomes of um, uh, early TCAR versus CEA after acute neurological events, again, symptomatic patients, 728 patients. This was a matched cohort. TCAR versus CEA, they defined, um, in a, you know, uh, symptom onset less than 14 days, a ipsilateral stroke with a ipsilateral kind of carotid lesion, and they showed that TCARs actually performed worse, 3.8 percent stroke rate versus 1.8 percent stroke rate. Conclusion, TCAR within 14 days of a neurological event conferred a higher postoperative stroke rate. So there's a little equipoise in the literature here, or what are we doing um, in these maybe more vulnerable lesions? Uh, are, are, we, are we doing patients at a service giving them a TCAR over a uh, CEA? So our study goal was to investigate the differences between carotid endarterectomy and TCAR performed for symptomatic patients. We identified difference in endpoint stroke incidence or stroke severity. Our null hypothesis was that surgical intervention, uh, regardless of type, CEA versus TCAR conferred no difference. Um, methods, we did a retrospective review of prospectively maintained system-wide TCAR database between us and IU, uh, looking, ranging from 2015 to 2023. Patients were stratified based on surgical intervention, TCAR versus CEA, and the, the big uh, kicker here in the study is, so how do we define unstable lesion? I put that in quotes on the title slide, title slide for a reason. And uh, we use the SVS criteria, so patients uh, presenting for surgery within 14 days of a stroke or TIA, a TIA, you know, being a, a unilateral weakness or, or symptom change or amaurosis, no weakness, no, I mean, no syncope or um, anything like that, ipsilateral to a hemodynamically significant lesion was identified for this study as, quote, an unstable plaque. Um, relevant demographics, medical conditions, uh, anatomic characteristics, interim postoperative courses and adverse events were captured for analysis, and standard multivariate Cox regression and Wilcoxian uh, rank sum test was done. So our total cohort, 2,540 patients in our carotid database. If we break it down by symptomatic patients and asymptomatic patients, 476 of these patients are symptomatic prior to their revascularization. 
2064 were excluded for this study, which are, we considered asymptomatic. Of the symptomatic patients, 229 received a CEA and 247 received TCAR. Postoperative or perioperative 30-day stroke occurred in 16 of these 229 in CEAs and 10 in the TCAR cohort. Looking at the baseline demographics, I know this is a busy slide. Big takeaways here, and not unexpected, is that those who got TCAR were, were sicker patients. So the Charleston comorbidity index is significant for six compared to a four TCAR versus CEA. Um, and not only were they sicker from a physiologic standpoint, you look at the anatomical risk factors, such as high lesion, restenosis, previous neck dissection, or neck radiation, all significantly more present in the TCAR cohort. Again, this is kind of expected. If you look at our preoperative medication, aspirin and clopidogrel, not unexpected that these were more frequently found in the TCAR cohort than single antiplatelet, which is more frequently seen in the CEA cohort. Uh, another thing to take away is, you know, this is still not 100%, so DAPT is not 100% in the TCAR cohort, and that's because some of these patients, 12% in the TCAR uh, cohort, were on anticoagulation. And you can see the statin adherence also is not quite 100%, but it's high at 96%. Um, and again, not unexpected if you look at estimated blood loss and op time, TCAR, shorter op time, and shorter uh, blood loss. Most of the patients in both the groups, IU and us at the University of Texas, received general endotracheal anesthesia and uh, protamine reversal at the conclusion of the case. So kind of the meat of the study, the perioperative outcomes, if you look at the strokes, so let's break it down. So eight, eight strokes in the CEA, uh, nine strokes in the TCAR, if we break this down by stroke type, which is somewhat hard to ascertain, um, but we, we ask, reach out to our neurological colleagues, uh, MRI, not all these patients had uh, MRIs to classify these, but the majority were ischemic strokes. So 75% ischemic in the CEA cohort and 88% uh, in, in the TCAR cohort. And then we looked at stroke severity by Rankin score. So from you know, zero is no symptoms at all, one is some symptoms, but basically at baseline and six is death. We tried to see, do these patients do any worse if they have a stroke after a TCAR versus a CEA? And it, it's tough because there's such a low event rate analysis to ascertain anything that's uh, of some credibility, but I just still wanted to report it uh, for reference. But if you look at the stroke rate, the MI rate, and the death rate at 30 days, and then the combined death and stroke rate, no difference between the CEA and TCAR cohort, again, and all these symptomatic lesions. Um, one thing, you know, we've all seen filter and plaques after TCAR, and so if you look at the nine patients that had a stroke after a TCAR, six of these uh, had filter debris compared to the uh, 76 out of 247 patients that had filter debris and the patients that got TCAR that did not have a perioperative stroke. And it's been kind of previously uh, hinted on in different papers, but filter debris, as expected, would be a significant predictor of postoperative stroke. Kaplan-Meier analysis of time to stroke following procedure, no difference. CEA or stroke, these patients uh, kind of stroke usually pretty soon, p-value of 0.48 after the procedure. And uh, length of stay was similar between the two groups, Kaplan-Meier here, again, p-value of 0.27. So limitations, so this is a retrospective review. It's, as I mentioned, it's difficult to power the analysis given the low event rate. I mean, it, it's tough to find a difference when the uh, stroke rate is so low between the two cohorts. Follow-up is not uniform, there's missing community data, and, and there's no, uh, there's limited plaque morphology analysis. Not all these patients had a preoperative MRI or CTA to, to analyze the kind of stability of the plaque. So in conclusion, symptomatic carotid lesions had sim similar postoperative stroke rate regardless of type of intervention. Stroke following TCAR trended towards worse functional outcome by Rankin scale at discharge and had higher uh, chances of more, a higher level of medical care at discharge, LTAC comp compared to SNF, but again, these just trended, there was no significance there. But TCAR can be s safely performed in symptomatic carotid lesions with similar outcome profile to those who receive CEA. Um, and further investigation is warranted to identify if, if these certain plaque morphology uh, characteristics can help dictate which patient should get a TCAR and should uh, get a CEA. Thank you. What about surgeon data? Like, were, was each surgeon doing 50-50 or 90-10 or 100-0? It, it, it varied across the board. So there were definitely a few surgeons in the cohort who were doing 50-50. I would say more often than not, it was probably 70-30 towards CEA. Okay. Thank you. Enjoyed your presentation. Nicely presented. Um, how did you account for selection bias? Meaning, how many of those first initially thought, oh, I'm going to do a CEA, then changed because the criteria for CEA or TCAR, vice versa, Changed. or exactly. Yeah. IFU for TCAR wasn't met, so it's flipped over to the other side. So how do you account for that? 
That, that's a great point. So just from this retrospective review of the database, uh, we, there's no specific calculation for us uh, correcting for that selection bias. I think if we broke it down and stratified it by surgeon, you'd be able to see a predilection towards a certain uh, intervention, TCAR versus CEA, but that's definitely a weak point in the data. Thank you for pointing that out. Do you have any uh, data on um, pre TCAR or CEA stroke severity and how it related to postoperative outcomes? So all these patients that were, you mean in terms of who got an intervention and, and what their ranking score was before the intervention, the majority of these, yes. So it's not complete data, but the majority of these patients had returned to their neurological baselines before they got an intervention. So there was no one that was a ranking three and above getting an a intervention in other data. Hi, Bjorn Zuko from Dartmouth. Uh, well presented. My, my question here is your definition of an unstable plaque yes. really just means a symptomatic patient within two weeks. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Just want to make sure. Yes. No, that's and so, <laughs> so then your, your outcomes show much worse composite outcome measures than what Roadster wanted mm -hmm. to show for symptomatic patients. How do you account for that difference? That, that's a great point. So I think, you know, we saw the Roadster data. We wanted to look at our own institutions and, and see how we compared. I think that number is underrepresentative of what the real stroke rate is for symptomatic patients. I think asymptomatic lesions across the board, you're going to see 1% stroke rate, TCAR, 2% CEA, uh, right around that range. But I think in symptomatic patients, that's, it's higher than we think it is. And, and the previous um, institutions we've looked at and compared our data with find similar results. And then you said that your patients for TCAR were pulled from your prospective TCAR surveillance database. Um, how did you choose the CEA patients and ensure that those cohorts were similarly matched and comparable? So we did not, in this particular study, did not do a propensity match cohort to match the TCARs with CEA. We just looked at all symptomatic CEAs, all symptomatic TCARs, and compared the two. Okay, thanks. Louis Cavani from Detroit, very nice paper. <clears throat> just, just to clarify, when you said 8% of the, 8 patients of the TCAR that had stroke were ischemic. You're not, that's not embolic, correct? That's ischemic stroke. And yet you say <clears throat> the TCAR people had uh, uh, strokes or had a higher... Uh, there were two hemorrhagic in the CEA as opposed to all the TCAR was just ischemic, but presumed that it, it's sometimes, it's very difficult to, I think, really get into the weeds of what's ischemic, what's embolic. If you look at kind of not all these patients had a DWI MRI, so it's tough to really kind of claim that from a retrospective review. Okay. Yeah, it's difficult for me to figure out. I'm sure there's some ischemic strokes in TCAR, but you should be done with the TCAR on 5, 10. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great point. So 15% were not on Plavix. Does that mean they didn't get loaded for the procedure? Because I don't think I can do a TCAR without putting my patients on Plavix or some kind of antiplatelet. My reps won't let me. So how, how did you guys do that, pull that off? Uh, I'd have to go back and see exactly which patients didn't get Plavix. I mean, that's a great point. I think some would say that they had an allergy to Plavix if you look at our database, and those patients were on kind of single antiplatelet and anticoagulation. Because there are other antiplatelets they can use too, right? Yeah, some of, some of these were also on Berlinta and, uh, and, and other antiplatelet agents, I agree with you, but there were a few that weren't on DAPT. And, and did... Were the strokes in those 15% or did it not matter? No, the, the numbers the, were really low. The patients that, the, the patients that had a stroke were on Plavix, DAPT pre yeah. And then finally, uh, you know, the best TCAR candidates that are asymptomatic have those soft lesions, right? When it's fully calcified, then you're going to do them mm -hmm. open. But I find symptomatically the soft lesions are the ones that are the worst. Sure. And so do you have any kind of idea of how many TCARs got post uh, stent dilatation uh, or a second balloon versus just a first because, you know, that stent continues to expand. expand over time. And if it's expanding in soft plaque, there's always a concern that that's going to kind of, you know, cheese grate through and, yep. and that's where you're going to get your strokes from. Whereas initially when you deploy the stent, if you balloon those soft plaques, maybe under flow that's reversal. going to make the flow reversal and, and protect. I, I don't know if that can be proven, but it's sort of my theory and it no, I think, I think that's a great point and, and something to look back at before we publish the manuscript and see if we can go through those off notes and, and of the symptomatic TCARs who had post dilation under reversal of flow. And that was kind of one of the things driving this study is, again, seeing these, you know, you do a karate, you see these cheese lesions, and you think, man, I can't believe I'm putting a bare metal stent across this. So great point. All right. Thank, thank you. you.